Welcome to a CBS News New York special presentation, Earth Day, Invest in Our Planet. I'm Dana Tyler. To celebrate this Earth Day, we're taking you around the tri-state area to see what communities and lawmakers are doing to support environmental protection. We begin with the weather. Major storms are becoming more common, causing destruction in our area. CBS 2's Lonnie Quinn looks at what's causing this change in the forecast. Many of us watch the weather with a different eye these days. It seems more often than not, a forecast of rain or snow turns into a major event. All you have to do is look at the precipitation extremes of the last several years. It's along the lines of when it rains, it pours. David Robinson is New Jersey's state climatologist. Excessive precipitation events have become more common over the last two decades or so. You can look back in the Northeast to Floyd in 99. I Irene was a major event in 2011, and then, of course, Ida in September 1st of 2021. Here's a little more detail. Floyd was a Category 4 hurricane that dropped more than 13 inches of rain. Irene was a tropical storm, but over 48 hours, it destroyed hundreds of homes and vital infrastructure. And then just last year, Hurricane Ida broke rainfall records as more than three inches of rain fell in just over an hour, rushing waters flooded subways and streets and, boy, trapped people in their homes. And only days before Ida hit, we had Henri. Those two storms gave our area a devastating one-two punch. There was a time where we would say, hey, there's a big storm coming, and people would kind of poo-poo it, right? Whenever we talk about flash flood or watch or flash flood advisory or a warning, people immediately are going to register in their minds what happened with Ida. Is this going to be like Ida in terms of potential flooding? I'm with meteorologist Joe Rayo at the historic Belvedere Castle in Central Park. And while it is one of the park's most iconic structures, for more than a century, this location has been a critical New York weather reporting station. We're able to see now storm systems, major storms, mega storms that we're seeing now in recent years and make comparisons to the storms that we had using, again, this same location, the same equipment 40, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. We were able to tell whether or not we're seeing greater amounts of rain. Plain and simple, it is essential to weather reporting to a Establish these benchmarks, whether it's for you know a daily forecast or for a big weather event. But you got to keep this in mind because even with the latest technology out of Belvedere or even here in the CBS2 Weather Center, there are some storms that just defy prediction. The forecasting of those very isolated storms that stall and sit in one place is still a long way from coming to any kind of high precision. Robinson is talking about an extraordinary 2014 rainstorm over Long Island that took everyone by surprise. To know that that would have set up on that particular day and it would have set up over Islip is just beyond our means. What hit Islip was a training storm. It's a meteorological phenomenon. That system pummeled a relatively small area with nearly 14 inches of rain. And unfortunately, there will likely be more extreme precipitation in our future. The weather experts, they say that one reason is the earth is getting warmer. That leads to more evaporation. That leads to more moisture in the air, which leads to bigger rain. We have had extreme weather events since the beginning of time, but we're seeing them now with greater frequency or with greater magnitude, I'd say, and we expect to see that pattern continue to increase. As we start to see more storms of greater magnitude, the science of forecasting is also getting better. Improving satellites and radar may not prevent dangerous weather, but it can mean earlier warnings to the public, helping to get people out of harm's way. On Tuesday, New York City opened a new rooftop farm on Staten Island that will help the environment. Mayor Eric Adams, the Department of Environmental Protection Commissioner, and other local leaders took part in the ribbon-cutting ceremony. The new 32,000-square-foot roof is planted with organic vegetables and perennial wildflowers. The farm will help absorb rainwater, keeping it out of the local drainage system while producing fresh produce for the community. The roof of this building has been transformed into a place for fresh organic vegetables to grow. Uh, that's a key and part of our environmental justice, and we're, co we're creating a more sustainable, living, eating city. The mayor says he plans to expand the green roof program across the entire city. 
Green energy is on its way to Long Island. CBS 2's Jennifer McLogan reports food scraps from restaurants, schools, and grocery stores will soon be turned into renewable biogas. The Millhouse Inn in Yaphank is saving its food scraps for a unique venture, and patrons are on board with their leftovers, too. I think it's great. You know, why waste it? Down the road from the soon to be closed Brookhaven Town landfill and not far from composting and mulch sites, a groundbreaking for the East Coast's largest anaerobic digester. This is a project called an anaerobic digester, and all that means is a tank with no air in it. Eliminating harmful methane. In closing, then converting and processing oils and food waste and turning it all into clean energy. It's going to help fight climate change, it's going to improve community conditions, and it's going to finally recycle food waste. Food and oils break down into a slurry that becomes renewable natural gas. It took 10 years to achieve an Earth Week celebration for American organic energy. We're going to take that waste in a scientifically designed sealed facility. We're going to extract the gas that's so polluting to create clean, renewable energy. Cutting back some of the major truck traffic, hauling away our waste to other states. This moves us, I would say, into the 21st century, really, uh, in a leadership role in the country. Composting and landfill sites have tangled with Yapank residents over fumes and dust. The digester is designed to eliminate those concerns. If it's good for the environment and if it, you know, limits the waste in Brookhaven, especially in this area, that would be a good thing. It will reduce the amount of waste in the landfill and add energy uh, to the grid. The food scrap renewable energy plant will eventually help power thousands of homes here. From Yapping, Long Island, Jennifer McLogan, CBS2 News. And there's some new green space for everyone to enjoy in Manhattan. It's on the roof of the Hudson River Parks, Pier 57. It is the city's largest public rooftop park. Governor Hochul and Mayor Adams were there for the official ribbon cutting Monday afternoon. The park is nearly two acres of lawn space. It's open to the public all year round from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. It'll also serve as an outdoor screening location for the upcoming Tribeca Film Festival. Two women in Connecticut have started an environmental movement of their own that might get you out of mowing your lawn. CBS 2's Laura Podesta shows us how their ideas are quite literally growing around the country. Things, first of all, no pesticides. Are Louise Washer and Donna Merrill admit this yard in Norwalk, Connecticut is a mess. But all the leaves, brush, and weeds serve a purpose. It's got all the uh, bee balm and the milkweed that the butterflies and the bees need. Those native plants give insects and birds a place to gather and transfer pollen to help the ecosystem thrive, even in towns and cities. It started with in 2017, Washer and Merrill created a nonprofit called the Pollinator Pathway, encouraging others to let their lawns go wild, stop mowing so often, and avoid using pesticides. People read about the insect apocalypse and, and the bee declines and the monarch butterfly, um, and this is something positive. This is something you can do. After signing up online, you can purchase a butterfly marker to let your neighbors know why your yard might not look picture perfect. The movement now includes members in over 300 towns across the country. It's seeding all over the United States. It's moving into the Midwest, into the Northwest, into the Southeast. Why are pollinators so important? Because 80% of the flowers and plants on planet Earth require an animal vector for reproduction. University of Montana pollinator ecologist Scott Debnam hopes the pathway will one day expand to unused farmland and the sides of roads and highways. And that's miles and miles and miles of available forage. Back in Connecticut, this is a wild strawberry. These co-founders are just getting started. Where do you see this in 10 years? I think we're really <laughs> changing something. I, I don't think this is stoppable at this point. They say doing less is really more when it comes to helping our planet. Laura Podesta, CBS News. New York City's new sanitation commissioner announced a big investment in cleaner and more sustainable streets in honor of Earth Week. CBS 2's Vanessa Murdoch shares the details that come with some controversy. Alternate side parking, or ASP, a way of life for many New Yorkers, including 83-year-old Frank Chindemi. 
I had to park in the street. I got no can't take it in the house. Uh, I hate Ultra Miss Hot Parking. Tell honestly. me why. I'm just getting up every morning. Rashawn Reese Hall may soon be more sleep deprived. New Sanitation Commissioner Jessica Tish announced Monday an $11.4 million investment that she says will make a big impact on street cleanliness. Full and, in my opinion, desperately needed restoration of alternate side parking. Right now, if a sign like this one shows more than one day, only the last day is in effect for that side of the street. But it went on for far too long and it largely sidelined the best clean streets tool in our arsenal. The almighty mechanical broom. Commissioner Tish emphasized pandemic policy disproportionately affected street cleaning. Cut it down by more than half. And there's this. For too many people saw a once in a while ASP ticket as just the cost of doing business. Angelo Vela says not him, but watches others risk it. They don't move their cars, they better get the ticket. Twice a week, alternate side parking will be back July 5th. We broke the news to this Crown Heights couple who bought a car during the pandemic. Disappointed, <laughs> bummed. Yeah, it's unfortunate. How do you feel it's affected the street cleanliness, or has it not? I, I don't think it has. Yeah, not noticeably. Protected bike lanes get funding too for cleaning. This micro mobility operation machine, or MOM, that helps with snow removal will be outfitted with a broom and vacuum to get debris out of the way of cyclists. From Crown Heights, Brooklyn, Vanessa Murdoch, CBS 2 News. Just ahead here on our special streaming presentation, Invest in Our Planet, how scientists are using this new technology to help protect Central Park against climate change. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Earth Day is an opportunity to take a look at the dangers of climate change, including the ways rising temperatures could be threatening our health. CBS 2's Michael George has the story. When wildfires fill the California sky with smoke, Brandon De La Paz feels the pain. I do remember going out and just kind of breathing in the air and it just hurt a little bit more than usual. De La Paz has asthma and could be facing many more days of discomfort. A Princeton study finds in parts of Northern California, the warming climate could cause particle pollution from wildfires to increase more than 50% by the middle of the century. Those tiny particles have been linked to cardiovascular disease and bronchitis. And for asthma patients, the effects can be life-threatening. It feels like you're breathing out of a straw. Um, and so as you can imagine, that can be quite uncomfortable, quite uh, scary. People don't realize that we see deaths every day from asthma. Thousands of miles from wildfire country, climate change is messing with Mother Nature in other ways that affect our health. As temperatures rise, so do pollen counts. That's because a warmer earth means longer growing seasons, giving plants more time to shed the pollen that causes allergies. At the current rate of global warming, by the end of the century, spring pollen season is projected to start about 40 days earlier and last up to 19 days longer than it does now. Dr. Purvi Parikh recommends allergy shots for desensitizing her patients. And what that does is that um, it eventually makes them stop reacting. So many of those individuals actually have had a very easy pollen season compared to those who aren't on it because their immune systems are not as reactive anymore. The CDC says as many as 60 million Americans suffer from seasonal allergies each year, a headache that will likely get worse. Michael George, CBS News, New York. For many New Yorkers, city parks are their only access to nature, but climate change is threatening our green spaces. Now, scientists are turning Central Park into a climate lab to research how the park is being affected and to find new ways to protect the environment. CBS 2's Chris Raggi has more on this vital project. Joining me now to talk about this project is Salman Khan. He's director of research and special projects for the Central Park Conservancy. And the Conservancy works year-round to maintain every inch of the park, but their efforts go well past its perimeter. Mr. Khan, thanks so much for taking time to join us here during this yeah. very, very important time with uh, Earth Day on everyone's mind. So when most people think of climate change, we think of, you know, rising sea levels, not necessarily city parks, but you say people no, need to start no. really thinking about city parks. That's exactly right. Parks are infrastructure and they should be treated as such. And that's what we're all about. So we're trying to figure out here. Can you talk to me about some of, I guess, the main climate change related threats that parks are facing right now? 
Yeah, they're facing, you know, all the same things everyone else is facing. Rainfall, hurricanes, heat waves, uh, you know, all these sorts of changes that are, are significant, but even more significant in spaces that are just not able to deal with them. What's at stake is the public's ability to access, you know, public open green space. And frankly, you know, the actual park itself, uh, it's as much a, a, at risk of being destroyed or hurt or damaged as any other space. Tell us about this whole Climate Lab project. Yeah, so the Climate Lab is uh, our effort with uh, partners at uh, the Yale School of the Environment and the Natural Areas Conservancy to A, understand how climate change is affecting urban parks, and B, figure out ways that we can sort of mitigate those changes. We want to protect Central Park and all parks over the long term. That's what we're trying to do here. And exactly, I guess, to kind of break it down for a person like myself who's not familiar with it, what are some of like the, I guess, some of the key implementations, some of the key factors sure. involved here? We're doing research on, just as an example, uh, heat. You know, how is heat affecting various parts of the park? How does it affect trees? How does it affect grass? How does it affect lawns? Um, and we're also trying to do research on the impacts on different parts of urban parks. So you've got, you know, lawns, trees, canopies, uh, water, all those sorts of things. We need to know how they're being affected, how we can address those impacts. And I guess to, to that point, these air temperature sensors that, that you've installed mm -hmm. in the park, yeah. I guess that directly relates to that. What kind of data are you going to get from those? Uh, just like what you said, air temperature, but more specifically, the air temperature in different parts of the park, knowing what's being affected and what's being affected more or less will allow us to come up with uh, ways of addressing uh, those impacts. You know, and I guess when people start to hear about this, they'll say to themselves, well, maybe I need to look around and see, you know, see where these sensors are. Will people be able to see uh, this study? I mean, will they be able to pick up on certain things and be like, oh, I wonder what that is, or I wonder what those people are, are taking you know, information on right now? Yeah, they will absolutely be able to see it. The sensors themselves are rather small, but a, a perceptive person will be able to see it. But they'll certainly be able to see the researchers in the, in the park throughout the year. And I know this is obviously your life's work here. Are you excited about this? Are you excited about what some of the results may bear out and, and I guess, different changes th that can be made to, to not only make your job easier uh, and more fruitful, but also make the park obviously thrive for for years well well beyond our time on this planet. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm thrilled about this. I think it's been a long time coming. Our staff is excited about it. And frankly, if there's anything we can do to make this better for the public and make the jobs of our staff better, we're excited about it. I'm excited about it. And that's where we're at. All right. That's really good to hear. Really good to hear. Salman Khan, Director of Research and Special Projects for the Central Park Conservancy. Thanks so much for joining us. We Thank greatly you. appreciate it. Continue the good work. And if you'd like more information about the Central Park Climate Lab project, go to our website, cbsnewyork.com. New York City's car-free Earth Day is back for the first time since 2019, and it's bigger than ever. The city's transportation department says it will be celebrated Saturday, April 23rd. Now, the original model of public plazas and car-free streets is going to be expanded with programming in all five boroughs. There will be 100 open streets, 22 public plazas, and more than 1,000 miles of bike networks to explore. Each location will have a variety of activities from music, dance, art, and some educational workshop. Coming up next, a major move to help clean up the coastline in parts of Queens, the efforts to give children and families a safe space to enjoy. This land is your land. This land is my land. And how these elementary school children are using their voices to challenge us all to get involved and help protect the planet. For two decades, a not-for-profit called Coastal Preservation Network has dedicated time and resources to cleaning up the coastlines of College Point, Queens. So, in celebration of Earth Day, this organization wants to restore Big Rock Beach to its former glory. CBS2 will be there to help out. Vanessa Murdoch highlights Coastal Preservation Network in this month's Better Together Project Green. Plastic bottles, wrappers, foam, old tires, and other unidentifiable debris clutters Big Rock Beach. There's a rusted out rig, too. It's heartbreaking to see all the trash and the plastic all the time because it really looks like nobody cares. Lifelong College Point resident Jim Clevin reflects on his childhood when this beach was the place to be in summer and this Big Rock the main attraction. Everybody in the neighborhood would want to have their photograph posing on the rock. He would jump off Big Rock and enjoy the cool waters of Flushing Bay. 
The glory days seem long gone for the beach that boasts a beautiful view of LaGuardia and we're told unparalleled sunsets. But Coastal Preservation Network has big plans to bring it back. It's really going to be a jewel for this town. President Catherine Servino tells us last month they removed a deck barge, paid to have it cut up and hauled away. Volunteers secured the stairs to boost access to. When you look at the beach, it still looks polluted, but you can really see the potential for it now. The next cleanup here at Big Rock Beach is scheduled for Saturday, April the 30th. CBS 2 News will be here to help Coastal Preservation Network get the job done. We will be working together to um, get dirty, get our hands dirty, you know, and fill up lots of bags of trash, fill up a dumpster. Get this beach back in summer shape and offer this reef a better chance at survival. Senior scientist Dr. James Servino says reefs prevent shoreline erosion, clean the water. And they're sucking up CO2 like little vacuum cleaners. But not when this happens. Look at this, this foam and sort of these plastics that are clogging the intestinal tracts of these of these shellfish. One mussel sucked a part of a toothbrush. Not at all what should be happening along our shores. Everybody should come out and volunteer, I think. Volunteer Miriana Karsik describes the challenge to keep College Point shorelines clean as constant. But the end result, a big rock beach kids can again enjoy worth every bag of trash removed. From College Point, Queens, Vanessa Murdoch, CBS 2 News. Finally, we're taking you behind the scenes at PS22 in Graniteville on Staten Island, where the elementary school chorus is helping the CBS network launch a new campaign. CBS 2's Jesse Mitchell brings us the song that we hope will have you singing along. The PS22 chorus is world famous for its performances, but this Earth Day, they have a special message just for you. It's lights, camera, action on the set of the CBS Network Earth Day campaign. I'm kind of a little nervous and kind of excited because I'm going to be in live television. It's giving me an opportunity to show my voice to others in other parts of the world. The spotlight isn't new for chorus director Greg Breinberg. Previous students have performed at the Oscars and a presidential inauguration, just to name a few. We've been on a hiatus for like the last few years, so we're so thrilled to be able to bring them into something that's not only going to give them a nice experience to sing, but something that's actually going to help our planet. This time, the song choice is fitting. This land is your land. The call to action to outgreen me on social media by showing your love for our earth. What do you hope to say by singing This Land is Your Land? I would like to like show people how Earth is really important to us because it helps us live here. Without Earth, we're not going to be here. Breinberg says hearing this message from his students is undeniable. I hope that the uh, children inspire the people who are watching them as much as they inspire me on a daily basis. If these kids can get together and do something special and, you know, in a, in a harmonious kind of way, we can accomplish anything as adults if we really try. Earth Day? Is a day we realize we have to protect the earth because if we don't protect the earth, we're not protecting ourselves. Wise words to remember. You can catch the kids singing on all CBS platforms across the country starting on Earth Day. From Graniteville, Jesse Mitchell, CBS 2 News. Thank you for joining us on CBS News New York for our special presentation, Earth Day, Invest in Our Planet. I'm Dana Tyler. If you would like more information on Earth Day or any of our stories, visit our website, cbsnewyork.com.